Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Wednesday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky, what exactly went wrong with Russell Westbrook? That's the question we asked Dan Wojcicki of the LA Times Part 1, Andy, of two shows with the great LA Times beat writer. That's next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how you get your podcasts, where you get your podcasts. Thank you to uh, everyone for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day. We certainly appreciate it. Locked On Lakers on YouTube as well is where you go to get the podcast a little early for those of you who can't wait for the all audio version. Uh, great, great show. Uh, Andy, we, we had anticipated having Dan Wojcicki of the Times for one program, but the conversation was so good, we, we had split it up in half. It's two shows now. Um, and so today's episode, all about accountability, all about uh, setting up for the coaching search, uh, but it starts with Russell Westbrook and the experience of covering him and trying to figure out exactly where this thing went off the rails. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Guys. How are you doing? I'm great. Um, I uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, um, tangentially involved with the Lakers. Actually, that's not true. Um, very involved with the Lakers, and they had asked me that same question, like, "How are you?" And I was like, "I have to be honest. Like, I feel like totally unburdened. Like, it is just, and I'm sure you guys feel a little bit like this too. It was like, like that season was hard to to like. It was hard to cover. It was hard to watch." It was at times for me very fun to cover, but I, I, I do feel like a, a tremendous weight was like lifted um, once the season finally went dark. When you say it was fun, okay, you know, like parts of it were fun. Sure. Which, which parts? Because I don't remember <laughs> a lot of that. <laughs> well, so I enjoyed writing about Russell Westbrook in general. Mm-hmm. Um, the guys on the beat used to tease me because I would always refer, I'd say the I'd say the word interesting a lot about him. Um, that it was just fun to watch. Again, fun is a weird, twisted word in this sense. It was it. Was, I enjoyed watching a player who is an all time great player. Um, and but like a person who it's really hard to describe why he's an all time great player. Like like, and that the more you watch him, you ask yourself, is he an all time great player? Like, you know, so like that part or of it, maybe I, more I, accurately, was he or uh, was he or he, he's clearly not at a level now where you would no. consider him an all time great. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't sure. And like so there was always like this and, and like, you know, his his flaws were more highlighted than seemingly ever before. Um, you know, his mistakes were just like so like bolded and um, I was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It was like the I. It's confusing. I always say like it's like the volume of his mistakes, but I mean it not in like a number. I mean it in like a spinal tap, the mm-hmm. amp goes up to eleven sort of way. Like right, like the Westbrook mistakes were on eleven a lot of times, and and you know, I mean, bas- I mean, this whole team's mistakes were like that too. But I think like you know, but uh, to me, to me, journalistically speaking, at least as a writer, right, like you want to cover either you either want to cover good teams because people are interested in winning and good teams and. And that winning always sort of provides fun storylines. Um, or you want to cover bad teams that are fun. And what was, f- like, fun bad, like, where weird stuff happens. And um, a ton of weird stuff happened this year. And it was, like, a fun challenge as a writer to try to say words like rock bottom when you knew that, like, a new rock bottom was just, like, like three games away. It's uh, funny that you started with Russ because – This was actually on the list of things I wanted to ask you, Dan, not necessarily here, but as as long as we've arrived, like your relationship with Russ, at least from, you know, a a Zoom perspective that that Brian and I had, because you were in person with the team more than us, but we were always on these pressers. You seem to have a less contentious relationship with him than he did with a lot of other media members. He actually seemed to like you more than other and, guys like well it's all it's a sliding scale really. <laughs> oh, really. i mean i didn't say he liked you i said he liked you more yeah. than he Let's liked the honest. other people so at the start of the year i did a really long sit down with russ yeah like we talked for a couple hours and i think i mean as a, I, I took a genuine interest in trying to like figure him out 
I didn't. I, I think I got him sort of in that sense. And that piece is sort of interesting, I think, if you go back and look at it now, um, because it is a it is a fairly flattering portrait of him, but it's not really much about him as a basketball player. Um, that it's like more about him as a dude. And I think like a lot of that actually weirdly sort of played out over the season. Like you would you talk to support staffers, um, people like around the team um who aren't, you know as invested in winning and losing on the court, you know, like everybody wants to win, but like, you know, maybe your job is something else in the organization. And those people all really liked Russ, like a lot. Um, you know, I know coaches who really liked Russ as a person um, a lot. Teammates who really liked him, um, you know, thought he was like a really genuine human being. Um, you know, obviously again, somebody who will be in the hall of fame and, uh, you know, is, is as good at, at doing this as almost anybody ever to do, have done it. Uh, I think, though, the frustration and the disconnect, and this was also like really evident in conversations I would have with people, is you would talk to people who really liked him as a person and who hated him as a basketball player. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's where you needed him. Um, you, you know, so that was it was an interesting sort of push and pull always. in in terms of that. But I think it was just a matter of like trying to tell his story at the beginning of the season and then trying to focus mostly on him as a basketball player Mm -hmm. throughout the year. Now, look, this is where it gets tricky with him, right? So he has always contended that like, I'm willing to take on any and all criticism as long as it's about me as a basketball player. But when you criticize me as a person, you make character judgments, that's when I get upset. Ultimately, that's not true, right? Like he's a pretty sensitive person who takes the basketball criticisms, I think. Um, I think he's had to build up a shell because the criticisms obviously are, are, are generally pretty easy to make, right? It's like he can shoot 40% from the field. I don't even know if that's what he shot. But let's say he can shoot 40% of the field. But if those six misses are off the side of the backboard, you know what I mean? Like people are going to respond differently to that. And I remember I like – I, I kind of – we had that one – I don't know if people remember this. We had that one exchange where I, it was after the Toronto game. It was like the only game that we did from Zoom. None of us went to Canada. And I had asked him sort of like – he had airballed that shot right at the end of regulation, and then he ended up hitting the shot to go into overtime, right? Probably his best shot as a Laker. And I was kind of like, you know, where do you get the confidence? Like after you just miss like that badly to to launch another one. He's like, I've scored 23,000 points. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's like – yeah, okay, that's a pretty good answer. Mm-hmm. But then, a like a, a, a couple of days later, I was talking to him. He's like, he's like, I don't get it. Like everybody else gets to airball. I'm the only one. It's like I'm the only one who airballs shots. It's like, no, it's not like that. But of like the great players, it does feel like you do it the most. It is so hard when you have a guy who is all time top seventy five, and and you and and to get those guys to pivot, and it is particularly difficult. When the guy who is all set, all top seventy five has done it in a way that is hyper specific in in a way that he is at least it seems to me incredibly proud of and and defensive of totally sort of not just that he's done it how he's done it and I think I mean everybody Magic Johnson, was wrong and expecting him to change yeah didn't Magic Johnson say and, and and he brought this up to me in one of our conversations early in the year like Magic during the finals. When he was, I think, in his second or third year, when the Thunder went to the finals, I think Magic Johnson said that it was like the worst point guard performance or something like that. It was a, it was a pretty like serious sort of like hyperbolic, uh, but cutting um, thing. And like he carried that. I asked him about it specifically. He's like, I have no response to that. We asked him later about Magic's tweet. He didn't say anything about it during the year. Um, you know, he carried that with him. And like, I don't know why he th- takes those things to sort of value judgments about him as a person necessarily. Right. Like, like if you say he chases stats, I think he takes it as, well, that must mean I'm a selfish human being. To be <laughs> fair to Russ, I actually think he's right in his interpretation there. People are saying that you are prioritizing your personal achievement in chasing those statistics. Sure over the final outcome or the larger picture. Yeah. Ergo, you are a selfish person that is part of your actual character. Like, and I'm not saying that the people are right or wrong about that with Russ. I'm saying he is right with that interpretation. That is what's being said. I think I, I so one of the example that was given to me that I, that I leaned on a lot when I try to write about him is like, and I can relate to this is, and I'm sure you guys can too, is, Think about like you come home from the grocery store trunk full of bags, right? 
And it's like, you can, the easiest way to get everything in the house, right? Is everybody take like two or three things, do it in one trip, whatever. But I am very much a, let's put five or six bags on the left arm, you know, like seven or eight on the right, grab, you know, grab the drinks too, and try to do it all yourself. And you're not doing that way to be a hero. You're doing it so like, you know, your, your wife, your partner, whoever can run inside, your kids can go inside so they don't have to do it. And I think like that was sort of the way Westbrook was pitched to me. Um, He's always been able to lean on that. This year, he couldn't. This year, not only did the team sure. lose, which isn't entirely his fault, but the production, the quality of play. Like end of the day, yeah. it's just bad casting. It is like to your to your point is like you got kind of what you expected is you you have a you have a player who has made his name, his fortune, um, his life in this league by by trying to do it all, and you put him on a team where you had the best do it all player in league history. You didn't have the right shooting, the right spacing, so you made it even harder to do it all in that way. And you said, "Oh, hey, by the way, like figure out how to do it." Now look his willingness to, to do things like cut and screen and stuff like that and defend at a higher level um, can and should be challenged and were. I know they were internally, certainly. I think, though, at the end of the day, though, it's like, right, like Russell Westbrook did, it wasn't getting paid $45 million to cut and screen. We could definitely do five hours on Russ, but we also want to turn to the front office and the coaching search. Yep. Accountability, Dan Wakey. Who That's is right. showing it in the front office? We'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Shady Rays, an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. That means polarized lenses, well-constructed, durable frames, premium high-end finishes, plus something you won't find anywhere else. Shady Rays, insane protection program. That includes lost and broken protection for every pair. They'll send you a brand new pair if you lose them, no matter what happens. So give them a try. If you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's that easy. Plus, it's great knowing 10 meals are donated to fight hunger in America when you shop with Shady Rays. So that's an awesome, awesome bonus. So for our listeners, head to ShadyRays.com. Use the code Locked On. You get 50% off two or more pair of polarized sunglasses. Again, code Locked On for the best deal of the season. 50% off two or more pairs of Shady Rays sunglasses backed by over 150,000 verified five-star reviews. Sam Presti MVP on Tuesday. His exit interview with the uh, with the oh my media god, and in, in Oklahoma City, which is by the way much a, a much smaller contingent than what we have with people who follow the Lakers, was over two hours. Yeah, um, Rob Polinka last week did twenty minutes, barely mm -hmm. cracked twenty minutes. Um, talked a lot about accountability, uh, all that stuff. This is. The day they have officially fired Frank Vogel after this train wreck of a season, the general manager, basketball vice president, whatever he is, gets up and talks to media for 20 minutes. Um, he talked a lot about accountability. Is Do you think they're actually showing any? What is your sense of the understanding uh, uh, and, and the accountability within basketball operations for what went on this year? Um, it's a good question. I think, well, let's start with like the most direct instance of them not taking accountability right which is the way frank vogel was fired mm -hmm. okay now look rob plinkin i don't know that rob plinka was a source or any of this stuff but like end of the day right if rob plinka is the only person who can fire frank vogel it's reasonable to, to, to say that somebody from the organization at some point like that information got relayed to somebody before it got to a reporter before it got relayed to frank vogel right o officially mm -hmm. unofficially whatever um I think there was a missed opportunity um, for contrition, a missed yes. opportunity to say, I don't know how this happened. We're not going to let this happen again. Frank Vogel deserved better. He won a title here. Um, you know, it was a really hard decision to fire him. And it made it like the way that that happened, you know, it was inexcusable. And like, that's all I'm going to say about it. Just know that, that we don't accept it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You say that and you can move on because I have been talking with coaches around the league. I've been talking with assistants. I've been talking with executives, scouts, the people that I chitter chatter with, I guess, professionally. And like, like, it, like to a person, they're like, wow. You know, like that was bad. I mean, Bill Orm had this in the story. I was in the hallway. I mean, DeMarcus Cousins walking down the hallway being like, they didn't even let him get to the plane. You know, like, he's like, damn, this league is dirty. 
like, you know, you talk to people like that, it is, um, and, and, and what makes it even more complicated or, or I think more troublesome for the Lakers is that people within the coaching community certainly don't think this was Frank Vogel's fault mm-hmm. either. Right. Like everybody understands that it's sort of like part of the deal, right? Like the GM isn't going to fire himself. You can't fire the players. So like, who do you fire? Like you fire the coach. Like it just, that's what happens. And I like people don't like it, but it is sort of an accepted part of life. I do think sort of the, you know, the, the semi public knifing um, after one of the two good, one of the three feel good moments of the last two months of the season is not a great look for the organization. And so that is problem number one when it comes to accountability. There was none taken there, and it will in some ways hurt them. It already has. Before we even get into some of the – you've written recently along with uh, Brad Turner at the LA Times about potential coaching candidates. I want to get into just why you think Vogel got fired because Rob Palenka said during this that, you know, that day wasn't – you know, a day for finger pointing or specific reasons, which felt to me more like avoiding literally things. pointed a finger like 20 minutes before that when he right. fired the person. He said, Right. You like it fired. felt to me <laughs> more like you're avoiding <laughs> transparency than excuses. But yeah, why do I, I have a I have a theory on it, or at least a theory on one big reason other than just needing a fall guy, if that was the primary reason. That is a big um, reason. But what reason do you think there is for him getting fired if there is one beyond just somebody's got to fall on the sword? Well, we were talking about casting before, right? And, and I think, right, like one of the – I mean, I'm not in management, but if I was in management, I would think, you know, one of – and I've seen this with coaches. Like one of the things that, that differentiates good management and good coaching and stuff is like you put people in positions to succeed, Right. Like you give them the tools they need to, to, to do what they do better than anybody else and, and let them do what they do well. And you, you, you try not to burden them with the things they can't do. Right. And, and you know, um, I do this like I wouldn't ask my child to go wash our car. He's two. You know, I would ask him to be cute. He's good at that. You know, he can giggle and stuff and, and tell funny jokes, but like he, he's not going to drive anywhere. You know, what's um, cute, though, is I, a two year old washing a car. <laughs> That's adorable. It, it, it would be pretty cute, probably. <laughs> um, it's, it's a good thing that that sentence is going to be in context for everybody who hears that. Um, I think that, uh, you, you know, with Frank Vogel, I think they thought he was um, like a defensive magician and not a defensive tactician. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think... You know, I think they thought it's like, oh, we'll keep, we'll give you Anthony Davis. We can trade away all your good defensive players, and you'll figure it out because you're a great defensive coach. We've got a great defensive coach, right? And reality is like you can't just invent defense. Like you had a coach who is a good defensive coach who uses good defensive players and puts them in good situations. You know what I mean? And has a good scheme. Like it's a proven scheme, but like it's a proven scheme that's by and large been required to have good defenders around right like that shouldn't be totally like withstanding but they chipped away at that every year just a little bit um and then this year they really chipped away at it um after they won the title so i think that was problem one and i i think just in general um psychologically and, and being around the team when i said that it was exhausting i think this is at the core was like what was the exhausting part was that the inability to solve problems, right? Like, like, and that doesn't mean that they had solutions, but I mean, you know, the problems on October 31st weren't that different from the ones on, you know, March 31st. Like they were kind of the same. Yeah, it was a repetitive season. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and so I think, I think that is something now, look, I mean, there was definitely people within the organization, definitely people within the locker room who didn't like, the way Frank Vogel handles starting lineups this year, um, who who would have preferred to see more consistency um, in Frank Vogel's defense? Like, what does it like? What lineup was good enough to be consistent? You know, and who, and um, which players of, were there enough to, yeah, to be yeah, in the lineup? Yeah, every who day. was healthy enough? Who deserved it every day? Right, and like so, it was sort of I think ultimately at the end of the day, right? It was like you take a little bit of all of this stuff plus just sort of the desire to change, add in the fact that like. We're being totally honest. Like he was never really their guy, anyways. Yep. You you know what I mean? That that he was someone that they hired kind of in the the wreckage of a coaching search last time. They got themselves a very good coach. Um, 
but he was by no means their first choice. He was someone they wanted to put on staffs. You know, they believed in him as an assistant. Um, given the opportunity to give him an extension, they gave him as minimal of one as they could. You know, it was, I mean, they just didn't show a lot of faith in him. And, and you know, this season when things were really bad, no one ever really came out and said, like, we believe in Frank Vogel. Um, you know, they did so by not firing him, I guess, like as passively as possible. But I just think at the end of the day, I mean, we, I just think that they, he wasn't for them. So what happens now is mm-hmm. obviously a huge consideration. They have tremendous amounts uh, of, of stuff to work out. Um, Lots of stuff when it comes to, to the roster. But the first thing they got to figure out is who's going to coach the team. A lot of interesting names uh, being reported by uh, people like you, uh, Brad Turner, in the LA Times. We'll look at some of those names and the process next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Built Bar. Eating smart, but also eating enjoyably. It's never tasted better. You can treat yourself without feeling guilty. For example, if you've not tried the puffs, you are missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. They are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. Th- this is what science was meant to to bring us. They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. They're not just a a protein bar. They are a treat covered in 100% real chocolate. You got awesome flavors like cinnamon, churro, coconut, marshmallow, banana cream pie, and again, covered in 100% real chocolate. And unlike a candy bar that's usually like two to 300 calories of just empty nonsense, Built Bars, they're just 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, only four net carbs, but 17 grams of protein, and that's the good stuff. So go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15, get 15% off your order. Again, promo code LOCK15, 15% off at Built.com. Um, so what, one of the things that, that we find fascinating about the Lakers coaching search, uh, Dan, and you kind of pointed to it, like Frank Vogel was not their first choice. He was not their second choice. They kind of fell backwards into him and you know had Jason Kidd ready there. So when they needed to fire mm-hmm. him in that first season, you know, a couple weeks in, you know, you got your and that turned out right to there. be a great partnership of guys that like ended up becoming like really close with one another. Yeah, it's sort of like they lucked into a lot of they things. They lucked into all this stuff, and mm-hmm. um, and it turns out like, oh, look, at and, and I think Vogel kind of recognized this early and was like, you know what, screw it, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to, you know, if I'm going out, I'm going to I'm going to make it hard for them. And you know, he he moved Anthony Davis to center in that in the second game against Utah, and uh, you know, kind of did did some stuff. Um. But, you know, before that, like there was no coherence in, in, the, in the process that got him there. Um, they've had 800 coaches over the, since Phil Jackson, none of whom make a whole lot of sense when you put them, like line them up together in terms of an overarching view of what a coach ought to be doing. And when you look at some of the names that are out there now, in your story, you, you point out Alex Jensen, the, the, um, the assistant in Utah right now. It's on the same mm-hmm. list in theory as Mark Jackson. Now, noted this Darvin Ham, yeah, show. Alex Jensen, Darvin Ham, right. you know, like those kind of guys. Yeah, sure. We we noted on Tuesday's show. This is not necessarily the Lakers list. Agents talk a lot of the, like the, we haven't got Mark to the Jackson point yet. is somebody reportedly LeBron wants as opposed right. to the That's organization. Not, what do you expect them to do though? Because Mark Jackson and Alex Jensen have no relationship to each other <laughs> in terms of a. Yeah. Like, oh, these two guys make sense to have on the same list. The same, you know can, the same want, candidate pool. Correct. If yeah. you know what you want in a coach, what what direction do you expect the Lakers to go once it's really the Lakers who are responsible for making the list of candidates? Well, I, I think the the thing that the best thing we can do is we can look back, and this is what BT and I try to do this weekend. Is I think you look back at that 2019 search, right? Like that is the um because it's the same people running it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same. It's the template to which we can kind of use as evidence. So, excuse me, in that search, right, we saw them early on heavily target target former head coaches, like people who had been in that big seat, right? Um, you know, like did they did they play around a little bit with guys that were assistants here and there, like? Maybe some guys who had some interim experience, like J.B. Bickerstaff and stuff like that. Yeah, but like the, the targets were pretty clear. You know, Tyron Liu, Monty Williams. Um, you know, if memory serves me right, Jeff Van Gundy's name was thrown around early in that process mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, you know, it was sort of. You know, this was not 
this was not discount shopping. This was like, a, you know, fairly established guys who have done it. You weren't, they weren't trying to discover anything. Like they weren't at the outlet malls necessarily, right? Like they were name brand head coaches. And I think, you know, putting that, that sort of framework against a team that has a 38, 38 year old LeBron James, right? Next year, I think 38. Um, you know, and Anthony Davis, whose sort of injury clock is always ticking. You just never know when like the big one is going to happen. If it's, if it hasn't already, I mean, who knows? Um, I, I, it, to me, it doesn't seem like a job for a first time head coach. Now it, it, that's interesting though, just because a there there's been a recent track record of first time head coaches, sure. not just succeeding, but winning championships in their first season with Steve Kerr, with Ty Lue, who the Lakers really could have, and I would argue should have had, mm -hmm. um, and Nick Nurse. You've got guys like Ime Adoka and Willie Green this season in their first year after tough starts yep. really starting to come into their own as coaches. Like I think the chaos in Brooklyn has made it difficult to evaluate exactly how good Steve Nash is. Who knows? But, yeah. but it seems like he's held things together pretty well all things considered under difficult circumstances. Sure. And the Lakers in their own history won championships with first time head coaches. Pat Riley. Paul West, Paul Westhead and Pat Riley. Yeah. So you would think at least spoiler alert, winning time fans. Spoiler. Sorry. Alert. Jesus. I that was inconsistent. We'll, we'll cut that. We'll cut it out. Um, but, but you know what I mean? Like there, there's I know the Lakers have this image of we're not a starter we're not a starter job like you, you got you got to have worn the boots so to speak to have done yeah. this sort of thing but I wonder if that is part of a larger perception issue they have about the organization in general and its own prestige even it's during like a decade I I, when they barely win them. it is yes. beneath them to have to go to sure. an assistant where, where they will cut off good options Oh no, I think a hundred percent. Right. And, and look, I mean, this is where we, we ask the question in our piece. And like, I, I don't know the answer to this is like, will they change? You know, will they view this differently? Will they look at, at a situation and, and you know, how creative will they be? Right. Will they look at college coaches? Will they look at, um, you know, assistants, NBA assistants? Um, you know, I was just spitballing with someone the other day, like, and I mean, this is, aggregators put your pens down this is just me like totally guessing like will they check on someone like don staley you know if you're like trying to hire the best possible coach who's available it's not a like an amazing coaching market i guess per se everybody hired coaches last year seemingly so a lot of what the lakers situation is right now is, is sort of in a pause like you wait to see who becomes available at, at like throughout the playoffs who gets fired you're, they're hoping that that Philly sweeps Toronto, the, the, the Raptors panic and fire Nick nurse or something. Yeah, sure. Like that. Yeah. You know, like see what happens in Utah, see what happens in Philly, see what happens in Toronto. Maybe. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any, I haven't really heard any Nick nurse to get fired buzz, but like, you, you know, maybe after a poor series, maybe Toronto's more than maybe everybody's a little willing to listen to a compensation call or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but I think like you, you wait a little bit to see sort of what that candidate pool looks like. And then you sort of look at, you know, you know and this is sort of, I don't want to say what I fear for the coaching search because I don't care, but like, I think like sort of ultimately I do not care, but I, but I think though, like, I wonder if, and this isn't necessarily bad because again, this is sort of what landed them Frank Vogel last time. Right. Which is like, you start to look at then who are some good NBA coaches right now who aren't coaching, you know, do you look at Terry Stotts? Do you do you look at Scott Brooks? You know, do you look at Lloyd Pierce or you know, like guys who have had experience as head coaches? Um, you know, there's some guys that are coaching as assistants right now that would certainly fit that bill as well. Mike Brown, Dave Yeager, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do do you look on some of these benches and say, huh? Or do you go like way outside the box and find you a Steve Kerr? You know, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think like seemingly um i feel like since i mean really since the lebron trade or, or the lebron signing i'm sorry like this organization has been fairly risk adverse when it comes to decisions um now that might seem crazy like i don't i don't view the anthony davis trade as like a risk 
Like, no. you know, you're trading. Well, no, that I wasn't mean, risky. Like the risky Russ, thing Russ was a pretty was. damn big risk. But see, but I don't, so like, yes and no. I mean, I think it was a risk, but I think like there's like a lazier way of thinking that says like, it's not yeah. a risk. Okay. Okay, if that it was star, like, if you're a star effort organization, you don't think it's a risk. Your words. I know. I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. And nobody I mean, I nobody think in that aggregates way. us, so it's not a problem. Yeah. So I think. So I think, like in that way, like you know, like <laughs> if you want to aggregate me, Andy Kamenetsky, the Lakers are star efforts. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so I mean, like you know, I mean do you think the coaching search will follow those trends? And I think that would be sort of where I would place my money right now is that they will, they will aim very high right away. And then when circumstances don't fall their way, they will be forced to, to, to look at through some, some other, other avenues. And my guess is that they would pursue an avenue that is more traditional than one that isn't. All right, so that's the first half of our conversation with uh, Dan Wojcicki of the LA Times. Lots more coming on Thursday's show, Andy. Um, we'll get deeper into the coaching, uh, the, the coaching search, what the Lakers could be looking for, and some of the issues that they're going to face uh, when hiring a coach. That is all on Thursday's show. Thanks again for making us your first listen of every day. Again, Locked on Lakers on YouTube, and we'll see everybody on Thursday.